Thank you very much for the invitation to read and discuss those papers. I found them really uh, interesting and I'm, and I'm glad to be here discussing them. Um, I'll make two general comments before going into the details of each of the three papers. And um, the first one is this. Those three papers, as well as many others that we've seen today, um, are based on microdata from uh, administrative sources. And this might seem quite normal for those of you who have started engaging with that quite recently, but when I started doing this research 10 years ago, there was no study using administrative data from any African country. So it's really amazing that we are now in a position where we can have a whole conference with so much great research uh, using this data to inform policy and to promote evidence-based policy making. I think this is really something to be celebrated both uh, for the researchers who are doing this work but also for the revenue authorities who are opening up and making this data available which is uh, not obvious at all. The second general point is that I think my main takeaway from many of the presentations uh, we've seen today and particularly the one on corporate income tax and uh, UCAS presentation is that progressive tax reform is possible. Um, it has uh, benefits on revenue and perhaps we shouldn't be too worried uh, about uh, um, the uh, tax base being eroded as a result of uh, increasing effective rates on uh, higher income earners or large corporations. But I'll get into a bit more detail. So I think that's important as we th think about the title of the conference, which is about increasing revenue. It's obviously a very important objective given that the big gap that exists uh, but as we do that, it's quite important for policymakers to keep in mind um, equity particularly, as well as efficiency, and not just increase taxes for the sake of increasing taxes in ways that are not necessarily equitable. So the examples today are examples of progressive reform. I think this is very good. Um, now, I've been asked by the chair to focus on policy messages and push uh, the researchers to, uh, to think about policy implications, so I'll, I'll try to do that. Uh, when it comes to the uh, VAT gap paper, um, again, the researchers are able to uh, show really detailed results about the VAT gap uh, by year, by uh, firm size, by VAT status, zero tax, positive tax, and so on. And that is allowed by the uh, microdata that you're using. Um, but I wonder if I can push you to speak maybe a little bit more about what does that data uh, allow you to say that is new? How do your results compare with the macro estimates of the VAT gap? Um, and what can, you, what can you tell policymakers in terms of uh, actions that your data allows you to say that, that wasn't necessarily uh, possible before? So I'd like to hear your reflections uh, on that. Um, and perhaps also on, on your estimates. So you say they are lower bound, and I see why you say that. Uh, but then I also read your paper and I know that the audit process is risk-based. So if it is risk-based and if it works, it means riskier firms are included in the auditing process. If, if the whole process works, they should be evading more than others. So by applying the same parameters to the whole population, you're actually overestimating evasion. And perhaps comparing the macro and micro figures might help to figure out where your estimates stand in terms of over or underestimation. Um, now, of course, the VAT paper was mostly about outright evasion based on audits, uh, but we know that gaps in tax revenue can be due to evasion, to avoidance, or sometimes governments themselves uh, leaving money on the table through exemptions. And I think that's where the second paper comes in uh, a bit on corporate income tax. Um, I found it really interesting to actually see a country level research looking at the implications of those uh, global negotiations on national tax administration. And uh, I think more of that is needed, especially because there is still lots of skepticism about how much those global, new global rules will actually change for lower income countries. Your results show some revenue gains. They also show some behavioral responses for uh, multinational firms. Um, again, I have, I guess I have a comment and a question. The comment is, or maybe it's also a question, I'm not quite sure about using elasticity from other studies in this case, because the, the innovative thing about those tax rules is exactly that they are coordinated across countries. So elasticity means you reduce your income because the tax rate is higher, because you have an opportunity to do so. Now, if these rules work, it means, every, it means those firms will pay 15%. The only question is where. 
So the only question is, will Uganda get uh, that 15% or will the other country um, where the firm is based take it? So I think possibly you're overestimating maybe uh, those, uh, those responses a little bit because if the system works, the opportunities for shifting income across countries shouldn't be that high. And that's the whole point of having a coordinated global um, minimum tax. Um, then, along the same lines of the previous uh, comments on the previous papers, I wonder if doing such a detailed an analysis with the microdata allows you to say a little bit about what the URA, the Uganda Revenue Authority, should do to close those compliance, uh, those uh, corporate income tax gaps. Um, can you say something about whether that is mostly about decreasing incentives, um, or whether perhaps it is about addressing corporate tax avoidance? What, what, what is it that, uh, um, that they should be doing tomorrow, uh, based on your experience doing research? Now, the final paper, Yuka's work, I really enjoyed reading the paper, seeing the presentation, thanks a lot for that. Um, Again, for me, that is, um, is, it's a very positive message about progressive tax reform because it, it was, a, 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 from an equity perspective, uh, an, an obvious reform to do, relieving those with lower incomes from paying tax, increasing uh, to a reasonable extent tax rates on higher earners, and your results show that the behavioral response is actually not, uh, not that large. So again, from a policymaker's perspective, Perhaps policymakers shouldn't be too worried, especially for higher earners on employment incomes to, um, uh, to see their tax base uh, eroded as a result of increasing rates. Um, I think, again, a comment and a, and a question, and then I'll, uh, I'll leave the floor to, uh, to the researchers themselves. Uh, the comment is I was really intrigued by your result that actually there seems to be a behavioral response for, em for employees of firms that are not under the uh, large taxpayer's office. So when there is a bit less enforcement pressure on firms, there seems to be uh, income shifting. And that, to me, from a policy perspective, speaks a lot to the role of firms um, as, as key players in, in improving compliance and, and potentially those higher income earners colluding with firms to, to minimize tax payments. So even for personal incomes, there is a very important role for firms. And I wonder if uh, that's something you can speak to uh, in terms of policy implications. And then the second very quick one is um, pay as you earn taxes on employment income are usually thought of as harder to evade. Um, so I, I'm encouraged by your results, but cautiously so, um, because I uh, cautiously so, because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can say something about taxing the wealthy more generally. Because that is, for me, it's a clear direction for reform. Uh, part of the direction of reform is applying the taxes that are already in the tax system on uh, capital gains, investment income, rent rental income, and so on. And, and those are quite likely to have slightly higher elasticities. Um, but um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, even though I know that is not exactly what you, what you focused on. And the fact that you find some suggestive evidence of income shifting makes me wonder if what policymakers should take away from research like, uh, like yours that you've just presented is sort of an attempt to equalize, ra equalize rates across tax types. Um, some countries already do that, most countries don't. So obviously, if the tax rate on dividends is the same as on employment income, you just take away the possibility of shifting income to minimize taxes. So these are my, uh, these are my comments. Again, uh, really nice to see so much work using uh, microdata. It's a, um, it's a great development, and I feel quite encouraged by your results that progressive tax reform is not only desirable, but indeed uh, quite feasible from an economic and revenue perspective. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you, Julia, for your insightful comments. So I would like to welcome all the researchers in the front of so we can have a round of questions. But first of all, I would give the floor to Sebastian to answer some of the Julian's points, and then Paul and, and then Jukka. And after that, uh, we could take some questions from the audience. Uh, well, thank you, Julia, for the comment. Uh, I so much agree with all. And actually, fortunately, one of the author of this paper, or my co-author, is also uh, an author of a more ma macro, macro data estimation of the PET gap. And we are trying kind of, okay, you obtained this, so we should 
obtain something similar or explain why we are not obtaining something similar. So part of our uh, next step is to go further in how to estimate better or predict better evasion to match better because only to include also we have uh, zero uh, evasion for the VAT so we can kind of predict what firm could show zero uh, evasion and so on so improve more so I'm so much agree uh, about the policy recommendation my impression is there is something happen with this uh, kind of fly under the radar that we need to understand and we need to attack. So if we already know that there is so less auditing for small sized firms and they are evading a lot, okay, so it looks like we should put more effort to auditing small sized firms. So could be that some of them are not small because of market things. It's because they are evading, actually. Uh, but uh, all the other things, I so much agree. Thank you. We are working on that. Yeah. To, for me also, uh, uh, I agree with uh, everything you have said. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll go forward and implement uh, some of your recom or all of your recommendations um, except the one on elasticities from other countries. I don't know what else we can do uh, without them. I guess we have to provide something, even though um, uh, it would come from a point of weakness, but uh, that's how we improve knowledge uh, so that the next generation of researchers will uh, hopefully use Ugandan El elasticities, uh, but given that uh, now we don't have them, even the ones we have are not published. They are just from. Um, uh, they are they are just from. Uh, they come from a position. They come from uh, a place where it's because we are privileged to be in certain positions. So we we get to see some studies before they are published, like the one I told you about World Bank. But we can't really use it uh, because also uh, it's work in progress. So I think uh, you will excuse us to continue uh, as long as we can provide a justification uh, and uh, be within a band where uh, we minimize the errors. But otherwise, I uh, like your comments, um, particularly on what URA should do to close the gap. Uh, uh, apart from just relying on uh, global initiatives. I think we'll provide that in the paper. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just continue saying the same, so I <laughs> completely agree. <laughs> uh, so uh, you asked about the um, policy implications for the, um, uh, the rise from income shifting. So to the extent income shifting is... Um, so that's a form of avoidance, not evasion. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, it it wouldn't mean that the um, that the those engaged in this would be would be working against the law. But I suspect that then the um, so one way of seeing it for the for the point of view of society as whole could be that then the I mean the if that's where the behavioral reaction comes from, it's perhaps less harmful for, for the economic activity than, than a real drop would be. Now, um, about other types of taxes um, uh, to, the, uh, to the high income earners, um, uh, so we were curious about the uh, personal income taxpayers in the, in the Ugandan case. So these are firm owners who have firms that are not corporations, but rather partnerships or sole proprietors. And there were so few of them that we couldn't do any meaningful statistical analysis on using those data. So, it, I mean, so the, for the high income earners, uh, what happens to this group that we are now analyzing completely dominates the revenue and inequality uh, implications for the, for, the, for the case of Uganda. Uh, 
Point taken when it comes to the, all these other taxes that we could levy on the, on the wealthy, including the various sorts of capital income, capital gains, etc. I've seen no work in the African context on these, and, 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 and even though they wouldn't be raising much revenue, they would still be quite crucial in terms of backstop, as a backstop on, on, on trying to avoid some of these income shifting or even outright evasion opportunities. So more work on that would definitely be welcome. And, 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 and maybe the most promising one there, and this comes close to what was discussed in the, in the opening plenary, is the, uh, uh, the real estate and, and property taxes. Thank you, Jukka and, and Paul and Sebastian. So next we will have a questions from the audience. Let's take, because we have quite a plenty of time, so three questions and then we give the time for our researchers to answer. So there is in the back, there is two questions already. So here in the, in there, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Helge Fjellstad from CMI, Bergen, Norway. Um, yeah, very interesting papers, and I agree very much with what uh, Julia said about now things are moving well, or it's very promising the research uh, which now uh, can use administrative data, the collaborative research between tax administration and researchers. Um, I have a question to Sebastian, the first paper on uh, Tanzania. Uh, there has been, uh, of course, a long, uh, for long there has been concern in Tanzania, among policymakers, among uh, IMF and others, that the tax gap is very, very high there. Also, relatively much higher in Tanzania than in other countries. Also, in the, in uh, other compared to other East African countries, and there has been some studies which um, has uh, addressed this previously. UNECA has had they estimated almost 80 percent, 70 percent, something like that uh, was the VAT gap. Um, and uh, but this study you have been involved with, Sebastian, is obviously one of the most solid, one credible ones I believe I've seen. Um, but the discussion is what is actually uh, how do you explain that? And you refer to tax evasion and so on. But the exemption regimes isn't that also a part of the story? You might have mentioned it, but the, we know also that the tax exemptions, the statutory exemptions are a part of the story. And uh, how do you take, take that into consideration? That is not evasion. Uh, that is by law. And then the question is, uh, the next question is uh, related to uh, what is driving tax of VAT evasion? One thing is that you estimate there is a big VAT gap here, okay? But what is driving the evasion? And what I find in my own work in Tanzania is the part of the story, at least, is that the, there are massive delays in VAT reimbursement, company reclaiming VAT. So, it, in a way, they, people are, or companies, they perceive evading VAT is a way, actually, to handle this unfairness in, in the tax system. Can you maybe reflect a little bit on those two issues? Thank you. Thank you. And then we have a one in the back as well, in the in the here. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. The, the presentations were very good and comprehensive. Uh, mine goes to Yuka, and it's probably something that was uh, discussed also by Yulia. I'm trying to look at the issue of uh, income shifting, and when you talk about. Uh, the idea of PIT for starters, is it in terms of uh, pay as you end? Because I'm trying to look at how you look at the compliance in that context. Because if it's under the pay as you end, I would expect that since it's being deducted by the employers, you wouldn't have much of uh, a problem in terms of uh, change in the rate. But then if it's being done by uh, individuals by themselves, the challenge you mentioned where high net worth individuals, you have a challenge with. Uh, getting them to submit, how does that come down to the smaller taxpayers? I would expect more of a problem in that context as well, in terms of uh, those taxpayers. When you look at the, the shift from uh, PIT to, to dividends, that increase in the dividends, 
what is the rate of dividends that's pertaining in uh, probably in Uganda, the, the, the country that you looked at? Is it lower than the, the rates on the PIT? Because if uh, you adjust the PIT and it becomes high, obviously there would be that incentive for the taxpayers to declare a revenue stream on which they'll pay a lower tax. Also then now you look at what sort of dividend is it that they are, they are getting? Because in partnerships, obviously, they'll get a dividend from the partnership at the end of the day, but that's not a final tax. They still have to submit their personal income tax uh, returns and get uh, taxed under that same uh, taxing regime. And to conclude, how, how do you handle now taxpayers who are self-employed, but would probably opt to go in a, a turnover tax regime because that essentially offers the lowest uh, rates that you would get. So you'd find that most self-employed individuals would opt to be on turnover tax rather than file uh, a PIT return, which might even be a bit too complex for uh, small taxpayers, I submit. Thank you. And then we have a one, one question again in the back. So. Thank you so much to all the presenters. Mine is not exactly a question, but um, a request for um, having more specific discussion of results and dissemination of findings to specific countries um, which are the, where the data has been sourced, specifically to revenue authorities, Ministry of Finance, for purposes of actually impacting policy in those specific area countries. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I will first give Sebastian time to uh, answer the first question, and then, of course, Jukka, Jukka can take the floor. Uh, well, thanks for the question and, and the comment. The comment. Uh, regarding the second question, uh, we discuss how to measure and uh, find the mechanism behind evasion, obviously partly because of all of your work in Tanzania. Uh, actually, we didn't thought about this delay on credit or see about credit, uh, which is a variable that we can estimate or create from our data, so thank you very much. We, we will see this. But uh, definitely is something that we have in our agenda to investigate because it's quite surprising the banching at zero for all the firms, and this is monthly declaration, so something is happened. No. And uh, regarding exemption, uh, I also so much agree. Uh, what we only did, but seeing data, is how are the exemption regarding the BIT evasion that we discover by groups, and uh, looks, I mean, looks like we cannot say anything for that. Uh, but what we have in mind is to explore with the deep in deep specification exemption and zero rated because we believe that something has happened. Perhaps they are declaring more or less there, or they are reacting through this. So this is a very good comment. I'm, I'm so much agree with you. Thanks. Uh, yes, excellent, excellent questions. Um, thank you for those. I'm not sure, certain if I can come up with a very good answers. Maybe Maria can can help me here. So, um, so I think I mean we haven't looked at it into this, and we, but we should. I mean, I think we could spot the uh, owner managers of small corporations because I mean, the, if the manager uh, is the person with the highest salary in that company, so then I mean to see if this behavior is more prevalent there. Uh, so then I guess if it's the same individual who's the employer and the employee, then this sort of negotiations are easier, right? And, and that, that would be one case where we would be worried about the income shifting between the two bases. Um, the turnover taxpayers, they are, they are not in our sample. And, and, um, and then the, uh, also the, uh, those who have uh, partnerships, they are excluded because there, there were too few of them to be included, included here. Um, it's a good, 
question also whether the, 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 the incentives are there actually for this income shifting because the Ugandan um, corporate income tax rate is quite high. So I mean, uh, uh, maybe it's because perhaps then um, uh, the actual effic effective rate is, is very lower than the headline rate. So that could be uh, something that uh, is then behind the results. Completely, I mean, uh, agreed on, 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 the, on the need to uh, discuss these findings. And, um, and, and we did uh, one event just before the pandemic in Uganda, and we are, of course, I mean, planning to have other ones, and, and, and we would be pleased to also, I mean, invite Paul to share his findings once the, once the results are ready, and uh, Julia uh, okays them for presentations as well. <laughs> so, yes, very, very much um, agreed on that note. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Okay, we have one in the, in the middle. We can take two or three of them if, if there is more than one. Yeah. Mine is not a question. It's just to give more insight to the question that was directed to Sebastian. It was a question raised that he, uh, in Tanzania, I think he, uh, there is, the figure is very high compared to other countries, which is true. It's not only because of tax evasion and the avoidance. It is also much to do that with the efficiency of institutions to collect the tax. Even with the rates which are there, they could do a big job of collecting the tax, but they don't do. That's number one. Number two, which is even much more serious, is this actually disease by foreign aid that has not given enough efforts instead of the institution the government to collect more. So that is, this is the country which has been receiving a lot of foreign aid. And the argument that that could be some of the reasons why we don't collect uh, much of what was supposed to be collected. And the, yes, and this has been a debate between the president and the business community that they collect VAT on the behalf of the government. It takes many years for them to be reimbursed. So that has done, that has caused those who are the firms and the, the consumers, those who are buying the products to collude not only that, they don't give the receipts, but even when they collect the VAT, it takes so many years for them to be paid. So they don't see a logic as per why they should engage in, a, in, a, in a collecting the tax, especially the VAT. And that's why their study, I think from TRA, they got even more, more, more percentage than what we got here. So those are the sum of the results that explain as per why Tanzania seem to be the top when it comes not failure to collect the potential tax compared to other countries. I think those are some of the few points which I led the problem. Thank you, and then behind you was one question there, and Mick, Mick has one. Um, it's just, one on Tanzania is, how are firms selected for audit? And in particular, could that have any bearing on the way in which you estimate for the full sample? Um, I have to add, because Vincent should have known this, um, that I don't agree at all and don't think any evidence supports the fact that aid has an adverse effect on tax revenue. May have happened in the distant past, certainly not the case now. Um, so that's not part of the story here. Uh, and just a question for Paul, more for information, but how many firms in Uganda are multinationals? In this sense, like I'm sure there are some, but I imagine there, and they're probably large taxpayers, but there's a small proportion of the, the population of firms. So why do you think it would have an effect on, on other firms? Okay, thank you. Then we have a one online. Uh, let's have that one at the third one, and then researchers can answer. Yeah, thank uh, we will have one round more. Yeah. All right, thanks. So there's a question online from Betty Ahuera. Um, could the issue of informal businesses contribute to tax evasion avoidance in VAT as formal businesses compete with the non-registered businesses, hence low tax morale? Thanks. Thank you. And, and, and we will have now the responses, and then after that we will have a one round more of questions. So go ahead. Uh, who wants to start? Paul maybe can now. 
Yeah, <coughs> the the variable MNCs uh, it's got from a study by um, is it Coivisto, Coivisto and, uh, and, and 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 company. Uh, they they um, came up with an estimate of farms uh, which are multinationals from the OBIS. Is it the OBIS database and matching it with the large taxpayer office? So I would say uh, maybe a thousand and. That, that's quite significant, uh, uh, given that uh, not a lot of farms are, uh, are pay CIT in Uganda. Majority are in the turnover tax uh, schedule. So yeah, uh, uh, I would say um, not the majority, but uh, probably 40% of farms under the threshold of CIT are multinationals. Yeah, and that could have a very big impact. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, more, more general, we know that uh, the process to select firms to audit could bias our estimation and obviously uh, the policy implication and the academic implication of this research in part is to improve perhaps the way in which we can estimate the BAT gap. So, uh, what we have in mind is, since we don't have particularly one, for example, rate or the assessment, we only see the firms that were audited is try to estimate the probability of auditing and use this to predict or sample the evasion. So kind of, if you are not audited, but your probability to be audited is so high, perhaps your evasion should be higher than what we are estimating now, and vice versa, if your probability of auditing is low or, or so on. So uh, this is something that we have in mind to kind of improve the estimation. But. OK, thank you. Then we had a, one more question, at least, from there. And we can take another one, if there is still some. OK, then behind it. So first, Joseph, and, and then behind you. Uh, mine is not even a question, it's just um, probably a comment and uh, following a recommendation that was made by Sebastian. Um, you mentioned that um, uh, small farms need to be audited. I think if I had you right. Like, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, the particular comment is what we saw in the data. It's percentage wise there are more large firms audited than small firms okay. so if small firms are evading more perhaps redistributing to auditing small firm could be more efficient but this is a, obviously a preliminary uh, yeah. recommendation okay it follows up from that because I think you basically need to be a little careful when making that kind of recommendation um, we were doing a study, I think, uh, on audits, looking at economic impacts of audits, and what we've observed that um, the more the intensity of when you intensify um, audits on small farms, they probably exit, they change form. They, so um, I think the kind of audit really matters. You basically, the kind of recommendation you come up Will, will it be an issue audit, will it be a comprehensive audit and all that? So you need to be very careful when recommending maybe the kind of audit that is supposed to be done towards these farms. Thank you. And then behind you was for one more question. Uh, yeah, also for Sebastian. Um, I'm uh, wondering if you're familiar with, so for example, the uh, internal, internal Revenue Service in the US uh, has this program where uh, they do a very small portion of audits actually at random um, with precisely the purpose of being able to sort of, being able to do the sort of estimation that you do um, in a way that doesn't sort of face the Comments that have you know that Julia and Oliver both uh, brought to you saying you know isn't isn't this really a biased sample because the, the the tax authority is not 
deciding who to audit at random. And so wouldn't, wouldn't that be sort of um, possible policy recommendation? Of course, you know, the, the IRS might have very, very different uh, tax capacity than the, the Tanzanian tax authority, but um, nonetheless, uh, it seems like it's, it's a sort of relatively easy thing to implement that uh, can Im vastly improve um, tax gap um, estimates. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I think. Okay, or Helge has still one. Okay, that's the final one, and then we give Sebastian time to answer. <laughs> no, I think the, uh, what we agree on is that there is a very good development here now that we can use administrative data uh, for our studies, which is a new development as pointed out by Julia. Uh, but we must also be careful when we use those data. There are big flaws, and I have digged into the VAT database in TRA. There are lot of problems with the data set. So, but this is the data we have. So that doesn't imply that we should not use it. And I think it's very encouraging to see that people in the panel and others are using the administrative data. But you have to be cautious uh, trying to clean up the data and also be, have a bit cautious about some of the recommendations to come because the data are often very problematic but it's more problematic not to use them, I think. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really like a concluding <laughs> comment. So, but Sebastian, if you want to answer some of the points, uh, you can do that. Yep. Uh, very short. Uh, I agree with the, that all of us should be careful with the policy recommendation. Uh, since this is uh, very, very preliminary work, we still don't go further to really say, okay, this is our policy recommendation and it's based on this that we are completely sure about that. So I totally agree with this. And uh, regarding the random of the auditing process and how the auditing process actually is seen for firms, uh, I agree. But I only want to point it out that we are here, and well, this is because I also work on this in, in not in firms in person. I deeply believe that also people who take decision have resources to think as us. So we start a kind of game theory play about okay, you know that I know, you know that I know, you know that I know. So it's always good come back and say, okay, we are in this game, so perhaps this is obviously, but if we think that this is obviously, the other part could take advantage of that and so on. So I think that is always kind of make, okay, we know that this is random, but perhaps can we see if actually they are seen as random as we thought and so on. Uh, so only a little. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. So I would like to thank everyone who have presented today here in the session and provide some comments and, and join the discussion. So uh, for my personal view, I, I'm happy to see these new studies coming up from these countries. And I think it's very uh, promising that in the future we know a little bit more about tax policies in the living countries and maybe can have some policy implications in the end. But, uh, but thank you, everyone. Uh, I will close this session.